Uh, so we can get started. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Peterson. Um, I'm going to be going through uh, some of the uh, usability enhancements we've made for Hyperworks uh, today, along with um, Kevin, uh, Chema, and Uli. Um, today, I'm going to specifically talk about our new Hyperworks startup dialog. And then just a couple of small uh, features relating to uh, ViewCube and um, some features we've uh, or enhancements we've made in the uh, online help. Uh, Kevin's going to talk about Move Tool. chama has got a um, mixed bag of goodies, I would say. And then uh, Uli's got a tool belt and a couple of custom uh, uh, custom related things type works. So uh, let's just get started here. Um, if the first thing you'll probably notice um, when you uh, launch Hyperworks in 2022 is that we have a new uh, startup dialog. Um, we have cleaned up the start menu a little bit and taken the client choice uh, away from the start menu and put it in this uh, startup dialog. Um, so some of the benefits here is you can choose the client um, from, from that one start menu uh, shortcut. You can also pick uh, recent sessions or models. Um, and the other benefit is when this dialog is up and while you're sort of picking your recent sessions, uh, we are um, launching Hyperworks, at least certain parts of it, some of the framework and infrastructure parts uh, in the background. So from this point forward, um, the invoke time is um, quite a bit less. So let me just show a little bit about how this works. There's all sorts of details um, with some of the um, old ways that I guess we used to support uh, startup. So let me just go here. Okay, so here's, uh, forgive all the builds I have there, but uh, here's the uh, Hyperworks uh, shortcut in the start menu. And you'll see that we uh, show immediately the uh, startup dialog. And there's basically two ways to interact with this thing. Um, actually, let me get one. Uh, there is a new session uh, side on the left, and this allows you to choose your client, um, pick an option related to the client. You know, each client has different options. Uh, choose your start in directory and click create session, and away you go. You can also interact with the uh, right-hand side. Clicking uh, any of these sessions or models will immediately uh, launch the application. For the session, it's usually a multi-window, multi-page uh, setup that you've got. And so it will just put Hyperworks back in the state that the session was saved in. And with the HM file, it will launch Hypermesh. And the H within the HM file uh, is saved the, uh, the last user profile that, that you had saved it in. So it, uh, really, these two sides don't really interact with each other. Um, everything is sort of automatic. Uh, you can also open a file uh, directly from recent sessions. Uh, what's supported today is session files, HM files for HM, and uh, MDL files for Motion View. We've also put the Getting Started page in here. Um, this is pretty much the same as it's been. Uh, it launches a local uh, Getting Started page, which has shortcuts to uh, Keyboard uh, and keyboard shortcuts and mouse controls, a uh, bunch of videos that kind of help you get uh, get started before you use Hyperworks. Uh, okay, so I'll just launch a session here. Okay, so um, as you'd expect, <laughs> Hypermesh just uh, comes up. Uh, let me launch another session. Now let me put this away. So here I'm going to launch from the taskbar itself. And the reason I'm doing this is to sort of show you where Hyperworks startup is sort of putting itself. So um, when you pin the app and start the app from the taskbar, what you are starting is Hyperworks startup. Uh, let me launch a different client. So just launching Hyperview here. OK, so here we have Hyperview. And um, the reason I'm showing you this is that you've got uh, basically what you have is Hyperworks. OK, so this is 
this is the application um, that we want you to consider is, is, is Hyperworks. And within that application, you've got you know, many clients, HyperMesh and HyperView, but they are all stacked under one taskbar icon here. And if you pin this, um, you can pin, well, you don't have to pin, but even if you launch again from the taskbar, uh, you will get the Hyperworks startup dialog. Um, okay, let me close these. Did I pin it? I did. Okay. Close these and I'll just get another session. There are two ways to bypass the Hyperworks startup dialog. One is the most obvious here. That's don't show me again. I'll just create an HM session just to show you where you can. Once you click don't show me again, you won't see the Hyperworks startup dialog. You'll just see the last application you used um, during during that startup. So if you're a, or I'm sorry, the last client. So if you're a single client user and you don't want to deal with, uh, you know, the recent files or recent sessions, you can bypass it that way. In order to get the Hyperworks startup dialog back, you go into preferences, and this is a common preference uh, should should be there for all the clients. Uh, and you just click Show Hyperworks Launcher dialog, Show Hyperworks Launcher dialog at startup, and then next time you launch, you will. Uh, Get the startup dialog again. Okay, uh, so there are. So that's one way. I said there were two ways to bypass the startup dialog. This one's a little more advanced, um, but I just want to show you guys here. It's also in the documentation. If you navigate to the startup, um, the startup directory. Uh, and you turn on hidden items. So this is what it'll probably look like if you've just got uh, you know, a regular install of Windows. It will look like this. What we've done is we've, uh, we've hidden the shortcuts that used to point to the specific clients. So if you remember in 21.2, probably even earlier, there were many uh, shortcuts that were basically pointing to the same thing. They were just tuning the client. And the reason we do this is because of units. You know, if you uh, only want to launch HG with however many units that is, uh, this is, this option is there. So without the launcher, this was really our only choice. Now, if you want to bypass the startup dialog, you can uh, click on properties on any of these uh, shortcuts and unclick hidden. Now, what this does is it brings it back in the start menu. So you'll be able to see it here. And when you are pinning the app launched from this shortcut, the app is pinned or, or uh, stacked on a separate uh, separate icon. So, OK, this is, uh, I would say, highly advanced. Probably not many people will want this, but certainly some of our users um, are familiar with working in a very specific way, especially if they want to have different start in directories in different folders for different projects. This is just something we've supported um, you know, for a long time, and it's still supported even with the launcher. But if they want to bypass that, this, you know, this option is here. Uh, so <clears throat> let me show one final thing with regards to uh, startup dialog, uh, and that is the start in directory. Um, let me actually just create I think I've already done this. OK, so I've got a test too. OK, so I've just copy pasted. Uh, I've taken this shortcut and I pasted it over here. Um, and this is, I would say, fairly common practice. But what you do is uh, if you want your um, start in directory to be uh, basically linked with maybe your project files and especially um, your preferences files, uh, you, you put it in sort of a fresh directory. and then you change the start in directory to whatever you want. Um, here I've done it with Hyperwork Startup. So if I launch from here, you'll see that our startup dialog recognizes uh, the start in directory, even if you hadn't specified it from here. So you basically have two choices with your start in directory. You can choose it from the GUI, which is probably the most straightforward way to do it. And it, but if you have multiple folders that contain multiple startup I'm sorry, uh, multiple shortcut links, that's also still supported. 
Okay, so just to get that up there. Um, I think that's basically it for startup. And all this is in the documentation as well. Um, you know, I realize uh, there, there are some advanced use cases there. Okay, so I'll move along here. Uh, next is just a small topic. Uh, ViewCube is um, basically in all of our 3D clients, at least most of them, including Inspire. Um, and uh, what we've done in uh, Hyperworks, actually, this is local to all view cubes. I think all the uh, uh, other applications, 3D apps, will pick it up uh, pretty soon. Uh, we've added uh, the option to make the view cube uh, local to a system or to um, you know some other thing that is not the global axis. Uh, so I'll just show a little bit how that works. Uh, I'll just get out of presentation. Now. OK, uh, so here's a file that I just brought in. Um, let me just create quickly a system. I'll just make it uh, maybe like this. OK. Uh, what we've done is we've added a uh, right click menu on the view cube. Uh, and you've got a couple of options here, uh, one of which is align to system. And this is pretty straightforward. You just uh, pick the system, zoom in, grab this guy. Come on. Hit the check mark and then uh, kind of away you go. Um, the way you can tell is that we've put the global axis down here to the left, um, but then this thing is uh, oriented uh, based on you know any user system, I guess, that you have in the model. Okay. Uh, you don't necessarily need a system, so let me reset to global. Um, you, if you have a nice view that you like, maybe you want to, yeah, maybe it's like this. Uh, at any point uh, that you've got a view that you like, you can right click and align the front of the view cube to the screen. So this basically performs the same action um, just without a system needed. And then you've got this local kind of view cube. So useful for, I think, submodeling or parts that aren't necessarily aligned to global. Um, I think that's probably it for ViewCube. Yep, I think that's about it. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, let me get back to my slides here. Uh, OK, so this is the uh, landing page for the HyperWorks documentation in 2022. And uh, we've improved the search. Uh, so we have a new team member um, who has gone in and uh, taken a look at the algorithm that we're using um, and uh, tuned some of the uh, some of the features of it. Uh, so basically, uh, what we've done here is we've uh, improved the search algorithm to return uh, more valid results. We've done this by eliminating the substring, substring search. Um, so basically, that the strings that you put in uh, more closely match the uh, information architecture that we have laid out. Another change that we've made is we search locally first. So if you're in a hyper mesh topic, for example, and you type in a search, we don't search all the topics like all the solvers or anything like that. We, we try to be smart about um, searching only the topic that you're in. In the case of hyper mesh, I think we search the reference guide and the user guide so you get access to all the API documentation rather than the full Altair simulation help. And then some tips here. Um, so, you know, when when searching, uh, it, it's it's better to use uh, titles and keywords. Uh, exact matches return much better results now. Uh, so you could search for Design Explorer or Mesh or Pattern or uh, Create Mark or Sequad 4, for example. Those are great searches that will probably give you result number one as the one you're looking for. Uh, you don't need quotes for exact matches, and um, this has always been the case, uh, but we, the way the, the current search engine that we're using works, um, we should avoid treating asterisks as string literals. Uh, so instead of star create mark, search create mark, because the way that our search al algorithm works is that it always treats this, this is not changeable by us, but it always treats the asterisk as um, 
as a wild card of, of one or more characters. So it's it's even more dangerous. Um, but anyways, it um, give it a try. Um, we think uh, given you know the um, use cases we've thrown at it, it uh, is giving us much better results uh, than than we were before. Okay, uh, so I think that's it. Um, I will throw it over to Kevin, I believe. Hey guys, uh, this is Kevin D'Souza, and I'm an application specialist for the UX program management team. And um, today I'll be quickly taking you through some of the enhancements that we have submitted for the Move tool in 2022. Uh, this is the slide that I've made making a list of all the enhancements uh, that that are submitted for this release, but rather than go through the slides themselves, I think I'll uh, jump to the product and uh, show everybody the changes that we have made in. So we are all pretty familiar with Move Tool. It's been there for some time now, and uh, it's the tool that we use to transform objects inside Hyperworks. To and to do that, we use a graphical manipulator. Um, which is drawn on the screen when you make a selection. And by default, we take it take you to the CG of the part here. And as you add an append to your selection, the manipulator is updated to match with the selection mark change that you just made. And finally, you can uh, uh, go and position it in a place that you desire and uh, complete your operation. Alternatively, uh, if you have not completed your selection, but you first um, position your transformation tool uh, manipulator and uh, then go ahead and uh, make a change to selection. In the previous releases, we used to still continue to update the position uh, of, or rather the manipulator state to match with the selection. And this was because uh, we didn't have the provision to remember the state of the manipulator previously. And this is precisely the first enhancement that we made, or rather an improvement that we made for 2022. In 2022 and further, um, by default, as you select and modify your selection, we do the automatic positioning of the manipulator as we always used to. But if you, from the default state, if you position it now in this case to a different orientation, Making a change to the selection mark does not update the uh, or change the state of the manipulator anymore, and uh, you can continue with your operation from from here on. And this kind of extends itself to other operations as well. So, for example, uh, you could always move push to a different tool. For example, I can go to show hide, hide all of these components, get back to move tool and uh, we make we make sure you're restored to the manipulator state that you were previously in. And to complement to these features, there there are there are a few more things that we added. And um, first one is the possibility to align your manipulator to a local system. So by default, your move tool manipulator is always aligned with the global axis. So it uh, it. So in case for your particular operation, if you want to uh, do it with respect to a local system and you already have that system defined, you could click on this button over here. It's select local system and you're taken to a standard system selector where you can define the system. And upon confirming the selection, the manipulator automatically orients its orientation and the position to the system orientation and origin. And uh, we confirm uh, we suggest this that you are in local mode with with a tick mark here and any further transformation. For example, if I need to rotate this bucket and a certain angle is always with respect to this particular system. So and something else, a few other things that you, you should remember. Uh, same thing about the position being retained also applies here. You could make a change to your selection and um, the position of the manipulator will not be changed. Uh, and this particular system will be in, in the mark in the tool till you exit out of it. So you could clear the whole selector, come back, and you can still see that it is remembering that uh, the position that was previously in the system. 
if you want to reset it and go back to global, uh, you can reset system here. And in this case, it's pushed back to the CG of the part or the component that you selected. We also added some additional behaviors to the align button to complement all of these things. So in, in the previous release, this particular button used to provide just one function, which was to provide a quick way to align your manipulator to the global axis. In this case, I'm reposition and click it. It aligns itself to the global axis. In 2022 and onwards, there's a few changes to this. So what, what we do right now is uh, in the I'm in global mode, I've repositioned the manipulator in a different position. The first click will align my manipulator to the global axis. And the second click will update myself to the CG of these two parts, which is which is the default one. And the same thing applies even to uh, the local case. If I'm moving something locally, and for any reason I have I decide to change the base point uh, and even change the manipulator direction itself. In this case, it does not do an uh, align to global, but rather an align to the local system, which is indicated by the tooltip here. The first click is um, re realigns or reorients the manipulator with the system, and the second click updates itself to the system origin. So there are a few more few things that I would like to mention uh, about these features, uh, kind of known limitations that we have currently. Uh, the first one is though. We remember the manipulated state. We do not yet um, support undo. So uh, if you if you do this and hit undo, the manipulator again goes back to the CG, and you'll have to align yourself manually back. But this is this is a thing which is of more of a global scope because we do not support undo for any of our manipulators today. And um, uh, once we have that in the future, um, this like selection undo will be able to. Uh, undo our manipulators as well, hopefully. The second second option uh, or the second remark that I wanted to make is um, currently we limit ourselves to select just Cartesian systems. Uh, that's because we do not have a manipulator equivalent of the spherical and cylindrical case. Um, that's also something which is in, in discussion. And uh, once we have that, have those manipulators in the graphics, we can put that to the move tool and support those those use cases as well. And last one, um, I, I guess it's more of a UX um, comment that I wanted to make. Since we added these three, three new, uh, this additional button, there are three buttons which kind of look the same, and uh, it's difficult for you to look at and tell uh, what exactly these are doing. So we are kind of working with the GUI slash um, icon team to try and see if we can um, get new icons which would uh, better. Uh, explain this behavior a little more clearly, um, or maybe even in, in, in the form of a uh, GUI suggestion. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, point to remember here is we, we need to do it not just in Hyperworks, and these icons are used even in Inspire and other products, so we'll have, we need to be consistent with that. But in the meantime, um, all of these new uh, manipulator behaviors and uh, uh, rules are explained uh, in on the online help, and uh, you could always go back to the documentation to take a look at uh, what's expected from each of these. So with that, I'll pass it on to Chima, who will be talking about some of the infrastructure and uh, um, uh, general enhancements that you made across the product. So from my side, I'm just going to quickly mention uh, in 10 minutes or so just some miscellaneous improvements we've done in other parts of uh, of, of the app for 2022. Uh, this is just a, a sort of cherry pick list of things that I thought would be interesting for for our Hypermesh users um, and for you guys. So I'll, uh, yeah, I have a list here uh, which you'll have access in the slides uh, for your reference, but uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and um, show you each in the product itself. So the first thing I'll mention is the uh, performance presets in preferences. So these are options that we already supported in our preferences. So uh, no new options for this release, but instead we've gathered uh, them together in this uh, performance section. 
So some of these in previous releases were scattered across a few categories like um, you know application and selection and a few others. So now they're in the performance tab and they're also grouped. So you see quickly our default uh, settings here under the default preset. Yeah, we added a preset called performance. If you switch to this one, it'll uh, basically like turn off the uh, usual suspects here when when you have a user that wants to increase some frames per second uh, uh, or has hit a limit there uh, with the frames uh, based on model size and hardware. Uh, these are typically the things that we recommend, uh, you know, turning off the anti-aliasing, the dynamic center of rotation, uh, et cetera. The hover highlighting also takes, uh, takes some frames there. So um, you can do that from here. If you switch back to default, it'll go back to how we ship it. If you say custom, you can customize it yourself. So for example, if you want to add the transparent highlight. Um, so that's the performance presets. Um, moving on to uh, snapping, we have a couple of new enhancements in snapping. So in 2021.1 and 2, we had added, uh, where's my snapping map? There we go. We had added uh, element uh, centroid, edges, uh, now in 22, we add also element mid edges, so sort of FE centric snaps here. If I went to a tool that requires snaps and I zoom in, you can see that uh, we have here the uh, edges of the elements, the surface of the elements, the nodes, of course. Now we have also the mid edge and we have the centroid as well, which was there in, in dot two as well. Uh, so those uh, work for 2D meshes of uh, many shapes. So here's a triangle. Uh, it works on 1Ds as well. I don't have here. Let me go to quickly go to create here and uh, I'll throw in a, you know, sort of random 1D element. And uh, if I go back to points, I don't know where I created it. There we go. I should be able to see the, the element centroid here. Well, I don't know what I created here. I thought it was a plot L, but maybe it wasn't. Um, oh, there it is. So uh, it also works on 1D elements here. That's the centroid there. Um, so uh, we have also a new snap, which we've wanted for a while, which is the whole center. So uh, we've had uh, snaps to whole centers before, but it was uh, restricted to, um, Sorry, my mouse here is going crazy. It was restricted to geometry. So uh, if you had geometric holes, we would always snap to the whole center. This was not available for um, for uh, for mesh. Uh, so what we've done now is leverage our features. Uh, and the reason we didn't have it before was mainly performance cost. So calculating uh, FE holes every time is expensive. And we do that in a few tools. But now that we have the concept of features, and here I'm going to for the purpose of this example, just calculate to the holes uh, in this model. I'm going to find them. Uh, so features will uh, detect the holes and will store them in, in our database. But now we have access to, to this data, including the hole center. So now we've instrumented our snaps. If you do have to the holes in your session, uh, uh, then um, as I've detected here, just to show you. Now, uh, if I went back to the tool, to any tool that has snapping, uh, now I get the hole centers. So this works for uh, pretty much all the types of 2D holes that we have. So let's see, I might have some uh, more um, weird ones here. Maybe I want to do shape equals uh, general. Let's see. Let's isolate this to find them quickly. Uh, here I have a hole center. Um, let me exit. And then uh, let's do uh, here. I have a bunch of different uh, holes. Hopefully you were able to see it in my previous one. That's the mesh hole center uh, snap that we have. So if you do have holes, we support any any shape, rectangular, rounded, circular, etc. Uh, you'll be able to snap to them if you have uh, if you have features. So we do require the features to be calculated beforehand. Um, moving forward to uh, Another one, uh, you know, sort of smaller thing, but this is something that we used to do in legacy that was requested. This reacts to the uh, current component. So if I have a current component, holding control and shift now enters the view simplification mode uh, for anything except the current component. So it's a quick way to highlight the current part or component, but also uh, during rotation and pan, 
it'll use this view simplification. So control shift is now covered as well in the yeah, in HWX. Um, little other thing for tools where uh, where we have faces, locations, or uh, or edges selectors. So there's these special selectors that are not really entities, but sort of conveniences that we add. Uh, we didn't have support for selection and do before. So for example, uh, let me lower here the search distance. Um, if I zoom into here, I'll do Alt mouse wheel to change my break angle. Let's say you select this for an operation like morphing that I'm selecting faces and I do adjacent, adjacent maybe, Control J, Control J. Uh, and I did one more layer than I wanted. I can do Control Z, um, Control Z, and it'll let me undo and redo uh, based on my selection. So Control Y should work as well. Um, so that's supported now for edges, faces, and uh, locations. So now you can do selection and do and redo um, with the same rules that we have as a regular selection. So we have a buffer uh, here. If I undo and redo, my selection works up to five times. And also when you execute a command, uh, you can see it here in the undo list as well. So we keep uh, a certain number of element selections. If you do a certain command like delete or uh, anything else, then uh, then the the selection buffer also gets reset. So that's the same behavior we've had before. So we follow the same there for uh, for selection and do. Uh, tiny other thing, but uh, if you use the product a lot, you might uh, you might have been annoyed by this in the past uh, or or developed a muscle memory in our pull rights. Um, you had to like navigate very precisely to go to the pull right before. Uh, you know, little thing, but you know, uh, sort of a quality of life here improvement. Now you can navigate it diagonally, like like uh, you know, in many other apps. So now if you move your mouse diagonally, you won't lose the right click menu. So again, little thing, but you'll be happy to see it when you see it. Um, other quick enhancement here uh, for elements by ID selection. Uh, in the past, we had some troubles uh, copying and pasting from different sources, and this was because of the end of line characters or courage return characters, depending on your source. So we've broadened this a bit in this release. So for example, if you copy from Excel in the past, you could only copy in rows, I think, but not in columns. But we've improved that. Now you can copy from rows or columns and uh, paste it over here and uh, it should work now. So we, we catch, we're better at catching more types of uh, end of line characters there. So you should be able to copy paste from more sources. Um, and then finally, just one more thing. Uh, if you've worked with tools that have secondary ribbons, so this is something that uh, you know, I work a lot with morphing and it used to bother me a lot, but this was a little UI limitation that we've solved, for example, uh, for uh, tools where you have uh, secondaries like you would do if you're morphing using a um, uh, the morph volumes, for example, which are here displayed in a secondary. Let's say that you're working on this car and uh, changing maybe the profile of this roof. Uh, I'll do a little morphing there to make it taller. And uh, we had uh, provided some conveniences uh, here in the ribbon, uh, things like undo and save a shape were available as satellite, so you wouldn't have to interrupt. And in previous releases, any tool that was in a secondary was exiting, unfortunately, but we've solved that now. So you can uh, add a shape from your morph, you can undo your previous morph uh, to create a new one, et cetera. All of that works now without uh, interrupting your, your flow here. So you can create multiple shapes if you want to. And uh, and add them and undo them, and uh, uh, everything should work without exiting. So again, little thing, but if you've been annoyed by that in the past, uh, you'll you'll be happy to see we've solved it. We also have some issues with entering and exiting the morphing tools where we were losing the the mouse uh, the mouse will zoom. Um, just quickly mention that is resolved as well. Um, okay, I think that's it for my little quick summary of miscellaneous things that we've uh, solved. And I'll give the control to Uli now. Hey, thanks, Jima. Um, while I'm in, in Hyperworks here, I quickly also add, which we wanted to add this to the list, but we somehow didn't anymore. It's just that we changed the order of the ribbons here um, in all those tools to a more uh, modeling-like sequence, just as a uh, quick information on the side. And uh, now I just uh, go on with my last topic here, and that is basically a topic like 
access to tools, uh, custom access to tools. And that's why I'm bringing up the tool belt one more time, because the tool belt has been released in 2021.2, um, but uh, we get frequently the question on how do you uh, import a script and how do you run a script of uh, with the tool belt, can we load a script and, and run it from there? Um, there are ways to do it. And uh, what I want to do right now is I quickly show you, um, for those who don't use the tool belt or are not aware of it, give you a very quick brief overview of the tool belt. And then I show you how to get your scripts loaded in there and uh, via extensions. And uh, last but not least, there's a minor enhancement to custom ribbons as well. So that's what I'm going to show here. Um, the tool belt uh, has three modes, actually. It has a quick mode, complete mode, and a configuration mode. And you can start it by holding down your Alt key and the right mouse button or one of these other modifiers. And I just quickly show that in the tool. So basically, if you hold down the right mouse button, and the Alt key, you have this, this um, functionality here where you can select the tool you want to use. And if I let it go, then the tool comes up and I can use it here. Uh, so I'm just creating one little geometry here. And I'll do this as well with the complete mode. So I hold down the Alt key, let go the uh, right mouse button, and then it extends to the complete mode. And I'm just doing another um, additional geometry here. And what I also like is a little trick is when you um, click on it again, it'll switch off the tool here. So um, that's so much for uh, for the uh, tool belt um, minor functionalities. You can also switch on or off the labels and you can go and configure your tool belt. And the tool belt has, depending on which modifier key you're using, it has different pages like Alt, is more geometry focused in hyper mesh client. It's more mesh focused in shift alt and the right mouse button. Control alt right mouse button is more of model setup and uh, control shift alt is, is more the specialty tools depending on the client you're in or the interface you're in. In this case, OptiStruct, we have a lot of uh, optimization related content. Um, it would be uh, airbags and such in radios, for example. I also uh, tell you one more time um, that it works in other clients as well. Um, it works in uh, Hyperview, Hypergraph, and so forth in all the other clients which have meaningful amounts of uh, ribbon tools. And now let's get to um, the question, how do, you, how do you run a script in here? Um, therefore, um, I did other things in modifying installation files before, but that doesn't really help. Uh, it, it helps, but it's fairly complicated. So ext extensions is the way to go. So if I go to the file dropdown menu and say extensions and add uh, a previously defined extension here, which I will show you shortly what that is. But um, let me just go into my folder where I have the XML file with the extension in there. Uh, so it comes up here and I can enable it. And if you looked by chance here, you'll see that there's a tutorial demo page and an empty page here now. So and this tutorial demo page has uh, a script um, which is run by this icon, another script and another script. And just for explanation purposes, I also put a vertical divider here. And obviously, if you now go into your um, into your tool belt and configure it, you can put these tools in here. And um, then you have them accessible, or let me just move one over here. Uh, so you have them accessible in your tool belt. So the nice thing also is if you want to not show what you did, you can remove the ribbon here um, by just switching off. Um, the freshly added uh, ribbon, you can just hide it and it still will come up uh, in the uh, in the tool belt. So now I go back to the presentation and quickly show you how this would look like if you did that yourself. There is, um, you can use our new online help to quickly find how to define extensions and it's not all that complicated. So this is the folder structure, extensions XML um, is here. And um, this is what the extensions uh, XML consists of. Basically, you give it a name, you just have some versioning going on. And more important, you have 
where you hide your resources in the images folder. Um, I'll, so you you have the the images in this folder and the scripts are the, the scripts are actually in the in the ribbon folder and that you also have to define in the XML file here in the extensions XML, which sits there. And underneath we have those two uh, folders. And this is then actually the ribbon XML file, which consists of two main parts, the action list, where you basically assemble your picture with your script and you also tag it with a, with a tag you later can call and what's your tooltip, what's your name. And then once you have this action list, it's basically listing down everything you want to use, then you can go into your page. This is one of the pages, which consists of um, two different um, tools here and a little uh, divider in a separate group. So these are these two groups, these two and this is single. And then I defined another empty page just for demonstration purposes. And um, that's basically how, how this works. It's pretty simple. I boiled it down to the minimum here. Next thing I want to show is the custom ribbons. And here, basically, the most important thing I want to show is that they are now floatable. Basically, if you go in here and you create your own ribbon, you can pull, uh, pull your um, tools onto that ribbon and it opens a custom ribbon here. You can rename it also. So I just I call it geometry demo. Um, and interesting as well, of course, if you click somewhere in the ribbons, you have create new custom page. So you could create another page here. You can import or export uh, the, the ribbons you defined. But the last thing I really wanted to show is that it has a float button and you can use this and can float it in or place it anywhere you want and use it from there. So that was basically what I uh, what I wanted to show here.